All right, I think I think we'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the CERC annual research review. Um, this is um, track three for the technical tracks. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Yang from Stevens. Dr. Yang is a professor in the mechanical engineering department. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Dr. Yang holds 17 US patents in the field of micro and nano nanotechnology issued or pending. Currently, his research covers the growth and nanofabrication of graphene, carbon nanotubes, and other 2D materials, as well as the implementation of devices with tunable wetting and surface interaction. Dr. Yang, it's all yours. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk about 2D materials and more, more specifically 2D magnets and their usage for spintronics and quantum sensing, okay? So the need for alternatives to, to GPS is evident because the GPS signal sees real threats due to local jammers denying access in the region. So soldiers get into a region that where the GPS signal is not available and they can lose their you know, position. So uh, gyroscopes and uh, uh, any equivalent sensors uh, are very important here. The optical gyroscopes are widely used for inertial navigation, stabilization and positioning control systems. However, the substantial increase in swap is not conducive to the existing volume constraints. Uh, MEMS gyroscopes, MEMS stands for um, microelectromechanical systems. MEMS gyroscopes can make uh, can be made very small. However, uh, and also the even the performance uh, is approaching that of the optical uh, gyroscopes. However, the vendor's specifications are listed only after standard testing, and therefore uh, they do not include the shift after shock bias scale factor or misalignment after the shock event, right? So uh, we, we're going to focus on this ANIAC interferometer, which is the basis of that famous optical gyroscopes. So 1913, ANIAC proposed the idea of using a ring interferometer as a rotation ray sensor. Uh, it will detect the effect of the relative motion of the ether. All right. So we have these optical gyros based on this ANIAC effect, and it has excellent uh, biostability, but it is expensive and is bulky and fragile. So it can be used for navigation uh, for submarines and air, uh, airplanes, but uh, you cannot use this for soldiers, gun launch, and missile, that kind of applications. How about atom gyroscopes? Uh, it, its sensitivity can reach like 10 to 10 times that of optical gyro. That is a wow. However, the, you, know, you have to operate this extremely low temperature. So it, here, uh, the example given here is 100 nano Kelvin and high vacuum, high magnetic fields. And more recent advancement in uh, atom gyroscopes are much smaller, but still is a desktop type of size, still have to have the high vacuum and a low temperature, okay? What about we use electrons instead of photons or in atoms? Um, we use electrons and we find this ballistic uh, solid state material such as graphene and carbon nanotubes. You can, uh, we can one can achieve this low fabrication cost lightweight and direct integration with solid state electrical circuits while preserving its functionality. So theoretical uh, anticipation is uh, 10 to the six. Actually, this is not updated or 10 to the fifth. It's a 10,000 times better than optical gyro if uh, everything else is the same, okay? So the problem is, uh, here is there's a surprising no discussion was, done, uh, there, there was no discussion on gyroscopes applications using electrons. Only experiments were done with electron beams in vacuum, okay? So, okay, what about these electrons? So in 1924, De Broglie proposed the electrons can also exhibit wave characteristics. So this De Broglie matter waves, the uh, phase difference is, uh, can you click next? The uh, phase difference is uh, where the enclosed area of the interferometer, click next. Okay, so shown in this equation, right? Uh, uh, the enclosed area, that's A, and the rotation rate, omega there, and particle mass, M, and this uh, Planck's constant. So imagine you have this electron, you know, electron mass. Okay, so you, you get this, uh, uh, so have this uh, left-handed beam and right-handed right, right -handed beam, and then ro you know, rotation will change the path to length, and therefore you will have this interference here, all right? 
So if everything goes right, then measured signal would be larger than an optical interferometer, which is the ratio of the energy of massive particle to that of a photon. Okay. All right. Next one, please. So about 10 years ago, we kind of uh, kickstart this uh, project of graphene interferometer, and uh, we started this uh, growing, um, patterning, growing and patterning the graphene. Uh, and, and if you see the, uh, the top right side, next click, please. And you can see this is a double ring. Click next. Okay, and then click again. And then we also made this series of rings. Okay, but at that time it was a still early stage in research in, in graphene itself, and we were kind of uh, succeeding in fabricating this, but we weren't uh, able to get any uh, you know measurable or detectable or meaningful outcome there. All right. Now we are trying to pick up pick up. Okay, where is left? The thing is how to how to test this cyanic effect in graphene ring structure, which is under development. Okay. So looking at the optical gyros and these MEMS gyros, once they are packaged, then all you need to do is just connect and plug and play and put it under the rotation table you can test, right? However, if you have this graphing structure, uh, click a couple of times, please. Okay, next. If you have this graphing structure, uh, which is under development, then you, that, that means there's no package there. So you have this graphing structure, then you have to have this wire and the source strain, and you have to do wire bonding into the sockets. And that is a, a custom design to fit into your cryostat. Then and it is very, and we learned that it is very complicated in terms of wiring here and uh, um, grounding some, you know, uh, some of these leads and chassis and these things. And something goes wrong, then you can, don't get any signal there. So it is very complex. The thing is, how do you test the Sanyak effect? You need to rotate. Uh, this stage. So either you have this huge vacuum chamber with all these uh, uh, measurement equipments together, then you uh, rotate this whole thing, or somehow you have to invent a way to have this small rotation stage inside the vacuum chamber. The thing is, this is a nano amp level of the signal, signal, and you have to somehow wirelessly communicate this with the instrument. So that will probably require millions of dollars of investment in the uh, measurement equipment itself. So it is a little bit diff uh, difficult to to do it for now, okay? So we proposed the alternative way of doing this, this business. So that is add on a bomb interferometer. Click please. So add on a bomb effect is the oscillations in the resistance or conductance of a conducting ring as a function of external magnetic field uh, that is uh, applied vertically, okay? Orthogonal to this ring. So basically you can uh, obtain this phase shift and conductance uh, relationship. So basically, you measure the conductance, you measure the phase shift, and uh, and that is that is related to the applied magnetic field. Okay. So you either uh, measure magnetic conductance or magnetic resistance, which will show the fringes as a function of the applied magnetic field, characterized by fringe contrast, which will use to sense the magnetic field. Okay. Okay, so why am I why am I talking about the Arrow of Bomb interferometer so suddenly, right? We are why are I was kind of introducing this gyro view kind of approach to get these gyroscopes. So on interferometer based on uh, Arrow of Bomb oscillations is in principle equivalent to a rotation sensor using the Sanyak effect because from the Sanyak you will what you will do is to detect the fringe contrast, which is the same as the case of the Arana bomb oscillation. So you can have this equivalent kind of uh, equations and you have you, you can get the um, relation between AB oscillations and Sanyak effect. So you uh, basically show the AB oscillations from the certain structures, then you can say that uh, you, it will work for Sanyak, okay? Now, what materials we use uh, for solid state electron interferometers? It's a graphene, and although scientists knew graphene existed, no one had worked out how to ex extract it from graphite until it was isolated in 2004 by Gaiman of Oslof, and then they received the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. So graphene is a very interesting material, All right? Next, please. All right, and it becomes a, a valuable nanomaterial due to its exceptional property, like high tensor strength and electrical conductivity and optical property and also chemical property as well as uh, in uh, many others, right? You can electrically control the uh, 
um, formula level, and there are so many things that you can do. But we what, what we want to focus on the electrical uh, property here. Graphene acts as a 2D ballistic phase coherent electron system. So once electrons are in graphene, they behave differently. And they, they, they will be with long phase coherent lengths that exceeds five microns. Of course, this is a maximum or ideal uh, number. So maybe in reality, it is a smaller, but still it is much larger. Say it's a one micron still it's much, much larger than, uh, than those numbers that you can see from other ordinary material. There will be, there'll be a um, milli, not so, sorry, uh, hundreds of or tens of nanometer only, even at milli Kelvin level. So graphene is great in, in such a in such a such a sense because you have this uh, graphene ring, right? And uh, uh, you have to have this coherent transport of this graphene, which means uh, you have the same frequency and same vector uh, waveform, waveform, and then they meet. Then you you will get this stationary interference. That's you. That's what you need. And uh, you can make uh, ideally speaking, you can make your graphene a ring as large as five micron according to this calculation. Okay. Next. So we grow graph in here. So upper, so top left, it's uh, drawing shows the uh, growth scheme here. So basically you send this uh, precursor hydrocarbon gas to grow graphene along with the carrier gas, such as hydrogen argon. Then you heat up the, temp the uh, furnace uh, up to hundred, sorry, a thousand degrees C. And then you have this copper, okay, foil. And copper is uh, copper has very good uh, uh, adequate solubility of carbon. So what happens is is carbon atom atoms right decompose from this precursor, adsorbed onto this uh, copper substrate. Then as uh, after some adsorption, then you cool down the temperature rapidly. Then these adsorbed carbon atoms are crystallized into honeycomb you know lattice structure, forming graphene. So that's how it works. So once it, you do that, then you etch this copper substrate on the bottom left. That's the photo image of graphene that is floating on water. And then you scoop that, and then you can transfer the graphene to onto any other substrates, flexible substrates or any other substrate, and then you can do this over and over, okay? So once uh, you grow, growth is done, then next one is uh, basically characterization. So, uh, oh, so before characterization, you have to make something, right? So in our case, we, have, we create this graphene ring, which is rather simple. But in reality, you have to put HBN, you have to connect, and you have to put this electrode. So basically, you have to go through this process of even lithography and the patterning, and then transfer another patterning transfer. So it's not that simple uh, in reality. So we use this uh, growth, then we use this uh, uh, custom designed and fabricated um, alignment stage, transfer stage to transfer these 2D materials and then align them with the uh, submicron. Uh, you know, accuracy on top of each other, okay? And then we characterize graphene. On the left, you see this Raman spectra from this uh, CVD growing graphene, which shows good quality. It's a G-peak and 2D peak, and it has, uh, has uh, four with half maximum, shows that uh, the, the graphene color is good. Then on the uh, center, uh, this is the SCM images showing this graphene structure made to characterize uh, the, the you know, conductivity and other properties there. On the right is the, one of the examples here is IV characteristic from graphene connecting channel one and two, which is shown on the center, bottom center there, right? And uh, so the channel length in this case is 4.74 4 microns. You calculate the uh, resistance, which is about one kilo ohm, which is kind of consistent with what we expect, All right? Next. And then we uh, create this graphene uh, ring structure for the of bomb oscillations there. So on the left, it shows the structure. On the right, bottom right is a magnified view of one ring at the center. And so I put this dash sheet uh, in a circle there. And that a bright area is graphene. Then darker area is um, uh, exposed oxide. So uh, look at the left one again. And uh, so at the center, you have this graphene structure and then uh, left and right, you have these uh, source strain electrodes and top and bottom have, you have side uh, gate electrodes there. And then top uh, the uh, top right uh, is basically the uh, layout of the socket that you connect wire bond and then uh, with, with the chip mount. And, and uh, so, you know, this little thing on the chip mount and how to connect this and then in the chamber, what to connect, what to ground, and that, you know, is, uh, we had to learn, we had to go through all this the learning cycle that took us several, you know, months, more than a year, actually, okay? 
right next. But we, uh, you know, we are in good shape now. So uh, the overall uh, resistance through this ring is about five kilo ohm, or so it is expected, uh, considering the small size of the ring. Okay, because resistance is proportional to the air, uh, the the cross sectional area there. All right next. All right, so uh, we first perform this uh, uh, um, conductance, so the, the magnetic magne uh, magnetic field sweeping. So magnetic field will, uh, will sweep from um, negative 1.5 to 1.4. And we, of course, we can do more. We have other data set, but just I'm showing one of the data set here. And the source strain voltage applied to the ring structure is 4 millivolt and side gate voltage is 99. And so this is a uh, this unfiltered image, but you have this background resistance. Um, this is related to the direct point and other things. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go there. And on the right, then, after uh, manually removing, okay, subtracting this baseline, you see this uh, uh, oscillation. So we were looking for oscillations. And then in the first measurement, show these oscillations. So, wow, we got the oscillations. And then later on, the, after further studying, we learned that that is not what we wanted. This is uh, uh, due to the graphene's quantum hole effect, which is uh, well known. And this is uh, called the lambda level quantization effect. And uh, you know, with the large magnetic field, you will see the oscillations of the uh, conductivity or, uh, or uh, uh, resistance okay, through the structure. So what we did was, uh, so after several months of trial here, and we found that actually um, we can we can do this AB, we can detect these AB oscillations by finding this uh, denoising technique. Okay, so we have this uh, basically this, uh, denoising technique to find this uh, uh, noise level and then basically remove this noise level. So after doing that, we get this uh, graph on the right, which shows this. Uh, periodic oscillation with the peak spacing of uh, 0.82 millitesla. Uh, milli All right, so that's interesting. What does that mean? So if you look at uh, this graph here is uh, uh, a fast Fourier transform result. So y-axis is f of the amplitude and the x-axis is frequency. So 500 means you have 500 oscillations per uh, one tesla, okay? so. Um, this is uh, this corresponds to H over E oscillation frequencies, which is expected from Aaron Obom. Okay, oscillations. Next, please. And uh, we've done these calculations, and of course, this is a kind of uh, perfect case. You know, no defect, no edge states, and no spin orbit coupling. You no, know, nothing, right? But but you, you still you, you can still see this periodic uh, spacing that represents the Aaron Obom oscillation. So. This is significant in a way because you know there are a couple of papers published in or from Europe and there was none, none uh, research done in this area uh, in in US with the graphene ring, um, and they they use they uh, publish it and then they uh, use this millikelvin level of measurement. So you have to really cut down the temperature and we don't have millikelvin facilities, so we did it at four kelvin. That is a liquid helium temperature, and uh, you know I didn't expect that we would have we would get any meaningful result uh, at, at first, but you know, uh, after this denoising technique incorporated, we are um, very pleased that we get this uh, aerodynamic oscillations detected at, at such a high temperature, all right? All right, so what we do here is to enhance the design and enhance the fabrication process, also uh, incorporating gate tuning technique, all right? I'm going to uh, discuss the gate tuning a little bit there. So this is kind of lengthy process in you know, an enhancing design because you have the design you need refabricate and then test. So one cycle takes a month of effort, like full time effort by a couple of students there. So it's it's not an easy thing, but it is doable. It will take an year or so to get this going. Next. Now I have to discuss uh, fundamental limitations here. Okay, so Sanyuk effect is a phase coherent effect where the rotations of the ring result in a shift in the interference pattern proportional to the rotation rate. So you can see the equation, uh, the sensitivity can be as high as 10,000 times, 10,000 times uh, higher than uh, that of optical gyro if the area is the same. And the second equation shows the phase and then uh, rotation rate, omega, right? Phi and omega here. And then this phi is related to the uh, conductivity. So if you could detect meaningful conductivity, then you can detect the phase, that means you can detect the rotation. However, however, in graphene nanorings, this Sanyak effect is not enough to create a measurable conductance change. No matter what you do, you will not get anything if you play with Sanyak, unless 
you can you rotate the stage ten times, ten to the ten ten to the tenth radian per second, which it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, but it, it mathematically works. But you know, so that there is a problem that, that because it is because in the uh, optical gyro on the bottom uh, right drawing, you have this uh, miles miles long optical fibers. So photon goes this direction, that direction, and meets, and then you get this interference measured. So that's why you get this high uh, biostability, high sensitivity from this optical gyro. In our case, A is extremely small. The ring size is uh, smaller than a micron. So instead of having 10,000 times uh, amplification of sensitivity, no, probably you will have to attenuate 10,000 times. So it's, it's not going to work. OK, then what? OK, so we have to do a few things. OK, uh, next, next, please. So there are uh, possible solution. Uh, next, please. Um, so basically, you have to apply uh, E field and B field that is perpendicular uh, to the plane of the ring. Right. What's the problem? You can apply B field. You can apply B field. OK, uh, next. Uh, why do we do that? Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but with the applied magnetic field, the Zeeman, you can increase the Zeeman splitting. OK, and then with the applied electric field, you can induce the Rashba spin orbit interaction, you know, so that you can have measurable um, outcome there with that. The problem here is what is the whole message? What is the purpose of trying to uh, develop this uh, ring gyros, ring based uh, graphene electronal parameter compared to optical gyroscope, expensive, bulky, and, and heavy and uh, fragile? This can be uh, very small, low cost, very light, and you can put this in the flexible substrate, the high G survival. You can have everything else. How come you apply uh, external magnetic field and external uh, uh, electric field? That will defy the purpose, right? So that's the problem. But we, uh, interestingly, uh, the my group's research is exactly uh, you know tackling that issue because we work on two D magnets. Okay. So in this uh, figure, you have this on the bottom. Next, please. You have this two D magnet. Okay. So I, I want to talk about this two D magnet earlier. So two D magnet means. Uh, uh, it is 2D material like graphene. Graphene is 2D material, right? But say you have a material similar to graphene, but the material has a better magnetic property. That is a 2D magnet. Next, please. So this uh, 2D magnet was uh, discovered in 2017, so only five years ago. Um, then chromium triodide and europium sulfide, all these materials. I'm not going to into detail here. But uh, what, one thing that you have to see is the cryogenic uh, temperature. Okay, that means that the security temperature is extremely low. That means that the you have this ferromagnet and you have to cool down your surrounding temperature to see. So in the bottom, 45K, 16.5, and 61K. So 60K, that is a lower than liquid nitrogen temperature. If it goes up in temperature, then you lose the property. That means that it's not really useful in practical standpoint, right? And uh, so far, these materials were exfoliated. That means you have to use this scotch tape method as in 2004, the graphene was first isolated using this scotch tape. So it's the same thing. The problem here is it's great, but uh, there's no scalability. And some of these materials were unstable in there. That means you put it in there, then they, they're gone in a matter of weeks and months. Not good. So you need this uh, stability, air stability. You need to have scalability. You need to have this high critical temperature. Okay. And there were no, no uh, reports um, that fulfill all these requirements until 2020. Okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, when we first published this room temperature ferromagnetism in our grown material, next. And we do this uh, through iron dopings because iron itself is uh, a well known uh, ferromagnetic material, right? So we thought that, okay, maybe, maybe we could do iron. And it is easier said than done. It is, uh, it is very difficult because iron has very high melting temperature. But um, I'm going to skip that, uh, that material science part. So basically, you can replace this uh, molybdenum atoms by these iron atoms. And then these uh, uh, magnetic dipole moment exerting from these iron atoms basically uh, create these magnetic fields. So basically, your uh, material becomes ferromagnetic. OK? And this uh, was shown to uh, have this ferromagnetic property up to the room temperature. So I'm going to show you maybe a couple of uh, data here next. OK, so uh, I have several measurements, but uh, I'm going to just show one here. So this is a, a, a photoluminescence measurement, right? And uh, so the figure B uh, uh, contains the integrated PL for the band gap emission. So only the sulfide, 
that's a regular 2D material. Okay, and then iron dope molybdenum sulfide is our iron dope material that shows the ferromagnetic properties. So uh, the uh, red lines and green lines they are they are basically standard linear space. That, mean, that means they are just uh, regular emission band gap emission because it's a semiconductor and you have this band gap emission. However, if you look at the blue one, that's totally different. You know, pointed by the yellow arrow there. Okay. So that's related to the iron ions that is the substitutionary dot. Okay, so we scrutinize that. Next one. Um, so before showing another one, uh, just for those of you who are no, I'm, uh, next, please. For those of you who are not familiar with this area, so I'm going to explain some basics here. So the figure on the left is basically this uh, conduction band balance, balance band with the forbidden the band gap, and there is non-magnetic regular semiconductor. But if your semiconducting material ha is has magnetic property, then the conduction and valence bands are split depending on the spin direction, okay, of the of the electrons. Yeah. So that's called Zima splitting. If you have this magnetic uh, your material has magnetic property, you will see this Zima spray from this uh, material. Now, the spin polarized semiconductor band structure alters the absorption of clockwise and counterclockwise polarized light. So that is called MCD effect. Okay, next. So uh, if you look at A and B, this, these are circularly polar, uh, circular dichroism. Basically, you have the left-handed light and right-handed light, then you have this different absorption, different emission there, so you have difference. The uh, important thing is you see that uh, at 300K, that's the room temperature, figure B. So the transition matters luminescence loses the circular dichroism above Curie temperature. The fact that we see the CD at 300K uh, is indicative of the ferromagnetic property of iron dope molybdenum sulfide. Okay? And the uh, MCD effect that is uh, uh, figure C also shows this uh, hysteresis loop that is also showing the nature of ferromagnetic emission. Thank you. Next. Okay, so uh, okay, so we have this 2D magnet. So how does it work? So in order to show how it works, I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples quickly here. So we are working on this magnetic tunnel junction or MTJ, which is a fundamental or basic component uh, for magnetic random access memory, which in the future may replace existing random access memory, okay, RAM. So it's called MRAM. Okay, so it consists of three layers. Uh, if you look at the figure there, then three layer, barrier layer, fixed layer. So uh, free the free layer stores information and the fixed layer provides a reference frame required for reading and writing. So uh, you apply the voltage, then electrons flow through the MTJ to transfer uh, spin angular momentum between the magnetic layers because uh, you know electrons spin and then it's filtered at this hard magnet is fixed layer. And then it only certain uh, electrons with certain spin occupies this place, uh, you, you basically flip, okay, the property, the magnetic direction of your uh, soft layer that is a free layer. So it changes the magnetic state of the free layer, and that will write the information, okay? So that's how it works roughly, okay? Next. So we, um, and it, fabricating it, this is very, very complex problem, okay? Uh, but I don't have time to explain that. But we can, we can do that in this 2D limit which is very simple as uh, compared to a conventional method, which requires millions of dollars investment to fabrication facility. We can do this CVD growth and uh, transfer stage and stack we can show next. So we, uh, uh, we fabricate it. Of course, the fabrication itself in you know, a PhD season has spent two years literally in order to just get to this point fabricate. So it's not an easy thing, but anyway, um, so, you know, it, it, this shows the typical uh, tunneling characteristics at the low temperature. Okay, so below, because uh, below 150K, uh, the charge carriers and semiconductors start freezing, therefore increasing the resistance. So that's what we see. So this is the typical uh, tunneling characteristics. That means we have the right uh, property of the right uh, structure here for MTC. Next. Uh, so we have this, uh, again, a lot of. Uh, you know, up and down with some noises. So we already uh, uh, applied another denoising technique. And next, okay, next. So we have this data, but this is unpublished works. So I just, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, intentionally made this a little blurry. But what, what I can show here is uh, look at this uh, uh, peaks, right? This uh, rectangular thing and dashed line. So it's, you see the uh, red one, that is when you sweep your magnetic field from low to high, you and then you have sudden jump. So this is called the tunneling magnetic resistance. It's a magnetic resistance because it resistance, uh, but under the application of the magnetic field and it's through the tunnel. So it's a tunneling uh, you know, electron, okay? And then when you 
uh, when you sweep the magnetic field the opposite way, then you see this uh, uh, blue. Okay, so you have the sudden jump of this tunneling magnetic resistance at a certain uh, period of magnetic field strength. Uh, this is indicative of uh, having uh, this uh, flipping. Okay, this uh, uh, three layers on the, the the magnetic state. So basically, to, uh, demonstrate the control of magnetic resistance. Now. Key uh, idea here is our material is room temperature ferromagnets. Okay, so in 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 uh, in principle, this can be done at room temperature. So we are uh, looking into showing that once we show that that is a groundbreaking uh, discovery. Actually, okay. Next, uh, one more example is magnetic proximity coupling. So we work on quantum emitters for quantum communication here. So uh, tungsten deselenized is a well-known quantum emitter. We have very sharp spectral. Uh, you know, a peak uh, from this, uh, you can get from the quantum member. But then we we uh, put this uh, together with this iron dog monitor sulfide, which is a 2D magnet. This magnetic property existing in iron dog monitor sulfide is induced into the quantum emitter through the magnetic pro proximity effect. Okay, so the quantum member becomes ferromagnets. Then what? Uh, you look at the bottom right, it is basically delta E versus uh, magnetic B field, magnetic field, right? What do you see? You have see if they see this hysteresis, that means you can also control your quantum emitter using magnetic field because your quantum emitter now is ferromagnet. Okay, next. Okay, so we know that uh, these 2D magnets work and it has a lot of functionality that is extremely important for many uh, quantum uh, you know, applications there. So what we can do here is incorporate is to incorporate uh, our 2D magnets into this structure. So this drawing is very conceptual drawing and uh, actually in real thing is uh, much more complex, okay? Because you have electric field, magnetic field, another electric field, so it's very complex structure. So it, it will take years to finally understand and realize all these things. But basic idea is you don't need to apply external or external E field or B field. Everything is on chip. You can make this on chip E field, B field. That is what we can do, okay? Fundamentally. Now, we have this on-chip uh, E field, B field, so we can get some uh, measurable signal maybe, but it is still very weak. Still, is, uh, it's not going to be useful for future gyroscope applications. Then what, All right? A couple of click, please. Next. Dr. Yang, sorry, don't mean to interrupt, but we've got a few more minutes to go, just giving you a heads up. Just sure. three to four minutes. I know. All right. So uh, this is uh, actually from Chris Search, is uh, uh, Stephen's faculty, uh, who actually um, you know came up with this idea in his paper in 2008. Uh, basically, you have this graphene ring showing this coherent transport of an electron, and then uh, you have this branch. Then basically, complete dephasing is on. Then another coherent transport. Then basically, the sensitivity could be proportional to the number of rings. So, you, so for example, of course, this is ideal case, and we have we have we have lots to learn here. But but. If we fabricate, say, three million rings, right, one micron ring radius on small uh, substrate, and assuming there's a complete defacing of electrons in the branches between adjacent rings, this could yield an effective phase shift of 0.1 radian at uh, one hertz of rotation. Of course, this number itself has to be verified. It is not the final number, but it's rough approximation, and we have to work on this with uh, you know modeler, uh, the collaborators that will record the modeling there, all right. Uh, but this is interesting because that's existing inertial rate sensing technology, right? HRG and others, right? But again, uh, bulky and fragile, and you have this limited ap limited applications, right? It's expensive and uh, or, and uh, you know submarines and airplane. Okay, next. But what if we have this high G survival, low cost, and extremely small and flexible and um, you know chip scale technologies using these electrons in the future these gyroscope technologies can be used for soldiers right you can put a soldiers uh, boots and uh, helmets right uavs and uh, um, many other applications so that's what we are kind of uh, moving forward okay uh, to to achieve so i want to uh, acknowledge my students and uh, the, the the top part these are the students or postdocs who uh, partially um, um, you know join this uh, project and help and then on the bottom, there are collaborators and uh, professors Trav, uh, Chu, and uh, uh, Cummings, and uh, Mr. Hader, and uh, Yu Ping. Yu Ping Huang is a center, the director of uh, the Center for uh, Quantum Science and Engineering, who work together on this. Okay. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Um, does anybody have any questions, either here in the room or virtually?
All right. Looks like we're good. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang.